fire, the sun is out, the sky is clear, and this is Safari Live. And welcome to another Sunset Safari. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Craig aka Batman and as most of you know during the weeks we have schools from all over the world joining us and today we've got two schools joining us. We've got the British International School of Brussels as well as Diamond Springs so welcome to all of you. Uh, if you have just joined us and this is your first time watching Safari Live we're going to be dedicating the next 45 minutes to answering questions from those two schools so I look forward to hearing all of your questions but don't forget you can start sending in some questions now hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and we'll get to them a little bit later but look who we have first just hopping in the silver cluster leaf tree now I'm going to try and roll up to it very very quietly it's just sitting in the fork of the tree it was actually having a little scratch too and it's one of my favorite birds in the whole wide world it is the yellow-billed hornbill now I'm just scanning around to see if there are any others because normally they live in groups especially at this time of the year after all the little ones have fledged sometimes you can see well the adults feeding and teaching the youngsters how to feed he's just flown out of view there he is over here we'll see if we can get another view of him there he is just in the corner sitting in the shade he goes straight in just to the right of that bush willow there he is you got him Craig a little bit to the right up and to the right, up to the right, <laughs> there he is, oh there he's flying away, well as you can also see they've got beautiful colors not just the beautiful yellow bill on their beaks but they've also got the black and white feathers too. Now we're going to keep searching, it's a nice hot day, there's a couple of dams up ahead, maybe we're going to see some elephants playing, you saw Tristan in the pre-show but he'd like to say good afternoon. Well, good afternoon everybody and welcome to our sunset safari. It is a beautiful winter's day. You can see there's a bright blue sky. And as Taylor mentioned, my name is Tristan. And on camera today I've got Sebastian. And a special warm welcome to the two schools that are joining us this afternoon. I hope that you'll have a wonderful afternoon with us. It will be filled with lots of animals. Now we're in this area because I had tracks for a lioness this morning being around this area. So I'm trying to see if I can't find her. It is quite difficult because it's just one lioness on her own and the area that we're in the grass is quite long and is the perfect color for a lion to hide in but maybe with a little bit of luck we might be able to find it it's also a very good area for elephants and because it's quite warm this afternoon we're going to try and check some of the water holes and see if we can't find you some elephants now remember this is a live interactive safari so we are going to be able to answer any questions that you may have so if you have questions ask your teachers and they'll send them through to us and we'll try and answer as many as possible and for all our other viewers remember you can use hashtag Safari Live and we'll get to your questions a little bit later. Right Sebastian, lion time. That's what I think. What do you think Sebastian? Yes? Anything with a heartbeat. Anything with a heartbeat, fair enough. We can do that I'm sure. I'm going to try my very very best. Now it's always good at this time of the day to go and look at the water hole. So Taylor said she's going to go look where there is some water and like, she, like I was saying is that a lot of the animals will head there because when it's very warm they get very thirsty. It's like us as people when we play around in the sun all day long you get very thirsty and then you have to go and find some water and so this is the perfect time of day to go looking for water before the predators get too active so if you're an antelope or you're a sort of a small animal now is when you're going to go and drink in the sort of afternoon before it gets too dark and the, an the predators come out now I was talking about elephants and I was saying that we're going to try and see if we can find them and Taylor has found some signs of an elephant. I have indeed found some signs and I want to show you all but it means I have to jump out of the car now 
buttons and attach my earpiece. Come and look at this. So these are one of my other, well, the most amazing trees out here in South Africa and particularly in this area. It's called a marula tree. But you can very clearly see that the tree is two different colors. It's got the very, very white and gray bark and then you sort of get this big black patch in the middle or gray patch. Now this is mud and this means that there were elephants here. So what they like to do on these hot days, they don't just go down to drink water, but they also splash mud all over their bodies to help keep themselves nice and cool and to also suffocate all the insects that are biting them and feeding on their blood. Then they'll come here to a tree like this and the bark is really, really, really beautiful. It's sort of I don't even know how to describe it, but it's not smooth bark, it's rough and it makes for the greatest scratching post. So they'll come here like this, maybe even with their bottoms, do a little bit of this, a little wiggle up against there, and then they leave all of this mud behind. And if you look very carefully on trees that they use often, sometimes you can even find ticks, some parasites that were sort of lodged in here. And I'm just going to check carefully, but it doesn't look like there are any in here. Now this is also a way we can tell if elephants were here recently, but this is all dry you can see it comes off quite easily so to me that means that no elephants have used this tree recently but we're not too far away from the dam that I was telling you about so we're going to keep searching let's get plugged in again and then we can continue so it's a dam it's actually just down in the dip of this drainage line it's called treehouse dam it's quite big now I've been on holiday for the past two weeks and I believe it's been quite hot here. So the water levels could have dropped quite a substantial amount. But I'm sure that there'll be enough water in this dam for them to have a good swim. I didn't hear any branches breaking or any leaves crackling as I was out of the car. So I don't know if we're going to see anything here but let's have a look. Can you Craig, can you see any big grey things? Not yet? Not yet either. Sometimes I get confused and I call rocks elephants or hippopotamuses, but no, it doesn't look like there's anything here. Hmm. Let's poke our nose down here very quickly. Oh, do you know what there is though? There are lots and lots of birds around here. Have a little listen. Listen to what they're all saying. Isn't that amazing? We've got magpie shrikes calling. There's some starlings, some forktail drongos, and a hornbill, all in this big tree just to the left. Now they've all stopped here. Now I think what's going on is that there's a bird party, so there's lots of different birds feeding around here, maybe even coming down to have a drink. There's some over there. Now, Anushka, you're wondering, that bird that we saw earlier, the hornbill, you're wondering what they eat. Well, they eat so many different things, but one of my favorite things to watch a hornbill eat is actually termites. So, termites in this area, there's actually a termite mound over there. Can you see it just over there? Now, on a nice hot day like today, the, those chimneys that you can see would actually be open, and the termites, the termites will all be resting at the top, and the hornbills will fly down, perch themselves on the top of the mound, and then peck away. But it's really funny when they feed, because you saw that they have those very big yellow bills, and now that's quite difficult to eat. So basically what they do is they pick them up with their beak, they throw them into the air, and then they catch them, just like that. Can you believe that? Wouldn't that be a nice way to eat? Though well, I think our parents wouldn't enjoy that very much at all, but that's what the hornbills do. Let's see what else we've got. Let's try and find these magpie shrikes. They're just sitting around the corner because they're the ones making all the noise. And Anushka, you were actually saying, why are they making so much noise? They're probably just declaring, telling everybody around them that they live here, this is their spot. The birds have territories too. I'm going to get into a nice position and I think we'll be able to see lots of different birds and we can listen to them again. There they are, the ones with the long tails on the edge of that knobwood, knobwood, knobthorn tree. Can you see them? The black and white birds? Magpie shrikes. So they're quite excited and, and just like the hornbills, they are also gregarious. So gregarious means that they're sociable. They don't just live alone. So you might find again, mom and dad living with their youngsters from the previous year, and even the year before that. So sometimes you can see up to 15 magpie shrikes together and they're making a whole lot of noise. And the others are actually just down to the left. There we go, just on that tree where those birds are all flying. So. 
there's some starlings there too and then just on the right in the core right hand corner of the screen you might see a couple more long tails around there you have got to look very very carefully if you go up a little bit Craig now they've gone all quiet yeah, they're starting again so they're just sitting in there but they're very camouflaged and because it is so hot today like what we saw with the hornbill doing they're not going to be spending too much time out in the sun I think they're going to just hide away in the shade and they'll move around in groups like this of different species of birds so we've got the magpie shrikes we've got forktail drongos we have got hornbills there's lots of different birds all flying around you and they all eat at different levels so it's quite amazing so you'll have maybe the hornbills down on the ground moving hopping around through the long grass and then they'll scare a grasshopper and that grasshopper will be lucky and and sort of jump away and the hornbill will miss it but then the magpie shrike will swoop down and grab it and eat it so it's a great way to sort of flush all the different insects out because most of these birds that are here they are eating insects oh look there's another one down there black and white one no, it might be difficult to see oh it's just gone around the corner oh, no. ah, let me go forward Craig let me roll mm, nope the rolling is not going to work this afternoon now Anjali you're wondering why birds make their nests in trees not all birds make their nests in trees can you believe that for most of these ones that we are seeing though will use a tree but they have different kinds of nests so for instance a magpie shrike makes a cup-like nest so it's not well not really a cup-like nest but it's a it's a, not a nest in a natural cavity so they take lots of sticks and leaves and they put them together and they have that in the little fork of the tree or in a branch and then you'll get hornbills they like to use natural holes in trees so if a, maybe a termite or something has gotten into it or even a woodpecker has come through oh here's lots of lots and lots of hornbills just up here yeah. see if we can get a good view of one proving quite difficult I think if I go a little bit further forward there we go be quiet now you can see the yellow billed hornbills quite nicely there we go just on that branch on the right you're right there there we go Craig there's one isn't that cool? So the reason why they make their nests in the trees is to keep away from predators, essentially. But snakes and other birds of prey that may like to eat chicks or eggs, they'd still be able to get them. Now that's a different hornbill. That's a red-billed hornbill. How cool is that? Hello. Now you've seen two of the most common hornbill species we have here in the Sabi sand. There we go, just cleaning its beak. Hello, little guy. Hopping about in the shade. Now, seen as though we've been seeing so many of the hornbills this afternoon, and I hope I get to show you my favorite hornbill, the southern ground hornbill, the, the largest one that we have in this area. Hannah was wondering how long do these birds live for? Oof, Hannah, that's a little bit difficult. I'll have to check on in my book to see how long they live for, but I'd imagine it's a couple of years. Some of the birds actually live for quite a long time, but I suppose it can be quite difficult. Oh, look at the crested barbet. It's just sitting right there on the right hand side. Uh, <laughs> Craig, up here, look at my. No, no, up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. You're right. There we go. Look at that one. This is such a beautiful bird, too. This has also got yellow on it, but it's got yellow, red, black, white, all sorts of different colors on it. Now, it has an incredible call. And you normally only hear them calling in the morning and the afternoon, but I suppose, or well, in the later afternoon, you might be lucky enough today to have a look at it. Look, it's got a little crest on the top of its head. And just like the hornbills, they also make their nests in the trees. But it's beautiful, isn't it? I think what I'm going to do while you watch it, I'm going to very quickly get the... I've got an app on my phone, a special app that's got all the bird calls. And I really want you to hear the call of this bird. So you just have to be... I'll be there in two seconds. Right. Are you ready? That's, oh, listen, it's doing it by itself. I didn't even have to play that. Come on, call again. One more time. I think this one can understand English. Come on, you want to call again? I was just telling everybody about your beautiful call. That was amazing. I was just about to play, press play on the bird call and then it magically did it all by itself. Okay, maybe it's not going to call again. Okay, I'm going to play the call now, so the next sound you're going to hear is me.
Isn't that cool? Now, I don't want to play it too much because this bird is quite close to us and they can be quite territorial too. And well, we don't want to disturb it too much. But that's beautiful call, isn't it? We're very lucky here in South Africa to have so many different types of birds. And birding is one of my favorite things to do. Now, I got a bit distracted by the birds, but Tristan is still focused on elephants and he's found a big footprint. Right guys, so what we've got here is a massive, massive footprint for a elephant bull. And these are really, really cool because they're nice and clear and I can show you exactly how we use footprints to be able to find the animals. So we know that this is made by an elephant because it's really the only animal out here that has such big feet. You can see, look at the size of that front foot. It goes all the way around like this and then comes this way and then the back foot over there. Now the reason why I know the difference between the back and front foot is because the front foot is very round. So if I draw a circle around the front foot, it comes around like this and then it will come into this back foot like that. Whereas the back foot is there and it comes over and round all the way like that. So there we go. There's the back and the front foot and you can tell how fresh these tracks are and how easy they could be to find this animal by looking at lots of different signs. When we're tracking we try and use the environment that we're in to try and see how to um, age the tracks. So we know that this has been from during the day because today has been very very windy which means lots of leaves have fallen off the trees and have come floating down. Now if they float down you see they sit on top of the soil but the tracks or the leaves inside the track here have been squashed by the elephant into the sand so it means that this elephant walked here sometime during the day also there is no other animals that have walked on top so we haven't seen any signs of impalas or any birds going over the top of it but the reason why I know they're not fresh 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 and mean that the elephant hasn't just walked is because of over here now Seb I don't know if you can see that but inside that track is a little hole and that is from an antlion which is a type of insect and the antlion basically is building a trap to try and create a trap for insects so they make this little hollow and then the ant comes and it falls inside and then the, pre the insect can grab the ant and feed off it so that's why we know it was during the day but not from right now now this big bull elephant I'm sure is going to go to some sort of water shortly so I'm going to go try and check some of the water holes and see if I can't find him but he was heading in that direction and the reason why I know that is because at the back here it is all very very smooth and there's lots of creeps so the smooth part is from the hill when the elephant steps it steps like that and because it keeps stepping there that part goes nice and smooth and gets worn the other reason is over here where we have the toe the toe is pulled forward and dragged the sand with them and that's how I know that that's where the elephant is going so we're gonna try and see if we can't find this big bull elephant but it's very exciting to see his footprints and did you see how big those footprints are they're massive it really is amazing to see how big these animals are Hopefully, I'll be able to find him for you and then we can show you just how big he is. But that's good signs. It means that they are around. Ah, Wahid, you're wondering why elephants have such big feet. Well, if you're a very big animal, remember an elephant can weigh almost 12,000 pounds. So he's going to be massive and he's going to be very big and a big body. And so he needs very big feet to be able to balance as well as to be able to cushion his body. So when we're walking, we like to use shoes with soft soles and so those shoes help to cushion our feet as we walk and with an elephant it's the same thing as they're walking it helps to just be a cushion so that they don't get hurt feet or damage their toes or their bones in any way so it's a very important part to have very wide very big very spongy feet it's like basically walking around with mattress on your feet so you know when you sleep you lie on your pillow or your mattress that's what the elephants walk on now our elephants are definitely going down to a water hole so I'm going to quickly try to see if I can't get to that water hole. I know which one that they're going to so hopefully they will be there by the time I get round because it will be nice to see them especially if they're drinking. Ah so they are going to be not too far. 
Ashini, you're wondering why do elephants have big ears? Well, elephants have big ears for two reasons. One is to be able to hear very, very well. So they put their ears out and it acts like a big dish or a satellite dish. So if you are in your classroom now, take your hand like this and put your hand on your ear and then listen to me talk. You'll hear that it will be louder. And so for an elephant, a very big ear means it can catch more sound and can actually hear what's going on. The other reason that they have big ears is to help cool their body down. An elephant is very clever. It's almost like it's got its own air conditioning system. So basically what happens is there's lots and lots of veins on the back of the ear covered by a very thin skin. And as it flaps its ear like this, so the wind goes over those veins and it cools their blood down. And it can cool their blood by as much as 2 to 3 degrees Celsius, which is in Fahrenheit. Oh, how much is that in Fahrenheit? It must be about 6 or 9 degrees in Fahrenheit, somewhere close to that. And so it cools the body very, very quick and because here in Africa it gets very hot they need to be able to cool their body fast to be able to sort of stay relatively comfortable in this very hot weather so it's a very clever animal indeed I wish we had big ears sometimes don't you Seb? it would be nice to be able to cool down like that well some of us have bigger ears than others but we definitely can't cool ourselves in the same way now hopefully our ellies are not too far. The water hole that we're going to is probably about, I would say, 10 minutes away. So hopefully they are there. So Drayden, the elephant has a trunk for lots and lots of reasons. They need it it's for to breathe. So the elephant will breathe through their trunk and into their lungs. They need it to drink water. So they'll suck water up and spray it into their mouth. They also need it to be able to eat food. It's like our hands. We need our hands to use our knife and fork to eat food. And it's the same thing for the elephant. So the elephant needs to grab its food and then put it in its mouth. And that trunk is like its hand. It can grab things, it can pick things up, and it can make it very, very easy for it to be able to survive so it needs its trunk for that also what it needs its trunk for is to protect itself sometimes so if things like lions come trying to hunt them then they can use that trunk to hit the lion away and keep them safe and keep their babies safe so it is very very important that they have a trunk without a trunk an elephant has a very tough time and it's not very easy for it to stay alive without its trunk it's like us if we didn't have arms it makes life a little bit more hard to try and sort of stay fit and healthy and to try and get all the things that we need so you have to to be able to have that trunk for them to survive right now we're going to try and get to this waterhole like I said it's not far away but while we do that Taylor's found something with six legs <laughs> two more eight legs in fact this is an arachnid a spider and I think if anything if I had to have a favorite spider this is it it's a, one of the jumping spiders I'm not sure which one we get a beautiful one out here called the zebra jumping spider, but watch it. I've trained this one. This is the circus jumping spider. Jump! 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 <laughs> Did you see that? Let's see if we can make it do it again. Come on. Up you come. Let's go for a higher one, but I can't see it now. No, 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 no. Not up my sleeve, yeah? Now, these spiders are really cool. I don't know why you can get them to do this, but they always seem to want to jump to another platform. Now, these spiders aren't venomous to us, so even if it were to bite me, which I doubt it would, I'm a little bit too big for this spider to eat, but it wouldn't be bothered by me. But they eat other spiders, and they obviously their venom works very well on another spider. And venom is very important to animals, to snakes, to spiders, anything that really has it. Because what it does is it actually digests their food. So they bite a fly or in fact a jumping spider bites another spider and it basically dissolves the spider from the inside out. And then, like they have a straw, they can just go and suck the insides out of their prey. Isn't that cool? Let's see if we can get them to jump again. Come on, jump, jump. And he keeps leaving a safety line as well. Do it. Come on. I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. You don't want to jump. That's mean. And he just wants to walk. Craig, I'm going to put it down here so you can see if you can get a close look at it. Because it's so beautiful. It's got the most gorgeous eyes. And it's very hairy too. Now don't jump into my face because I may squeal. Yes. Where are you going? Now for those regular viewers that know me know that I'm very brave for holding a spider right now because they're not my favorite thing in the whole world. Look how cool it is. Look at the beautiful patterns it's got on its body. Isn't that amazing? 
Erica's walking over there. Look at all the little hairs on its body. Now those hairs are also important. They're like little century hairs, so it helps it feel its way around. But it is just so beautiful. And I hope to find the zebra jumping spider, because like I said, they're about this size, maybe even a little bit bigger. This is quite a big jumping spider. And black and white which is so nice. Now they can jump quite a far distance. I wish this one was a little bit more energetic so that we could test its skills and see how far it could jump. But I reckon if it wanted to evade maybe a bird or something else that was trying to go after it, maybe another jumping spider, I think that it could jump the length of your ruler quite easily. I actually think that this might be a female because it's quite big and normally the female spiders are bigger. Now, Kanala, you're wondering, how does the spider jump? And hopefully it will do, uh, do it for me. I almost need an extra pair of hands. I need to be an octopus so that I can en encourage it to jump. It looks like it wants to jump. Jump. Come on. No? You're getting scared now. Um, so they use their legs. So they push themselves up just how you and I were if we wanted to jump up into the air. They push their will sort of crouch down with their legs and then spring up, push them up, and then they're able to leap. Now, what is quite interesting is that these spiders, they actively hunt, so they, that's so cool. They don't build a web, for instance, like a daddy long legs or even a button spider or something like that. So they walk around and they actively look for their food. But this one is actually leaving a safety line behind and it's on my shirt at the moment where it goes in case it does fall off so that at least it has a little web that it can hold on and swing back to safety. But now it's just crawling up my shirt at the moment. This is amazing. You are so great. I think I'm going to keep you forever. But you can't because you're going to get lost in my hair, in my mane. Come on, on my hands, please. Very nice little spider, isn't it? I think that we should let this spider go in a moment. Oh, look at its eyes. I wonder, Craig, can you get to its eyes? I'm going to hold my hand very still. Now, Azaria, wondering how does it make its home? Well, these guys are sort of free roaming, if you will, so they just move around as they will. Don't bite me. Don't bite me or you're going to be in big trouble. I'll tell your mom. And <laughs> so, so they don't make their homes, but they do if it was a spider that spun a big web. And we'll see if we can find some more spiders because they're really cool to look at. Don't go into my hand. It wants to go into a natural cavity to hide away where my fist was all closed up. And um, they would use their spinnerets. So they're these two little things at the, the back of their bodies and that releases the, the web. Come on, are you going to turn and show everyone your spinnerets? And then they have different types of silk as well to make their webs. But like I said, this one doesn't really make a big giant web. But we'll see if we can find a community nest spider or maybe even a golden orb web spider or garden orb web spider, which is beautiful. That is so cool. Look at all its little eyes. Ah, and Mrs. Roberts, Mrs. Robbins, sorry, seeing as though we're speaking about the eyes, you're wondering how many eyes does the spider have? Now, what's really interesting about the jumping spider is that they're actually, they're, they're eight eyes, but they're, 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 hang on, let me see if you've got eight or if you've got six. One, two, three, four, five, you've got six eyes. So can you believe I can actually count them? So it's got four on front. No, no, not up here. Here, on my hand, please. On my hand. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. I'll come here. Please, you're going to scare me because you're going to jump in my face. Okay, so it's got four in the front and then it's actually got two on the back of its head. So let's see if the spider can see me sneaking up on it. Watch, I'm going to try and bring my finger to the back. Oh, it knows that I'm coming. How cool is that? I'm going to release our friend the spider though. It's been great this afternoon. This is of course a wild spider. It's not a circus spider. I don't think you get circus spiders. I think Tristan has managed to find what he's been looking for. We have indeed. They just finished drinking at the waterhole and now they're coming up slowly towards where we are. It's not the big daddy elephant that we were trying to, sh that we showed you the footprint for, but it is a mommy elephant and her two babies, which is unusual. Generally in this area we see bigger herds than this. This is a very sort of small herd for us. Normally our herds are between 15 and 30 elephants together. But look what they're doing. You see they're spraying dust all over themselves. So what they did is they went to the water and they had a drink because elephants need lots of water in a day. And then once they have a drink they spray water all over themselves and mud on them. And then after they've done that they come up to where there's sand and they spray the sand on themselves. And the reason they do that is so that it creates a layer 
between the sun and them and helps to keep them cool. It also it manages to keep their skin in good condition. So you know if you go into the shower and then you brush with a brush or you use something quite rough to scrub your skin, it's the same thing for the elephants. This acts like that and then they go to a tree and then they rub on the tree and it's like using the brush. That's The sand basically gets rid of all the bad things on their skin and all the parasites. And so what we say when we're talking about a parasite, a parasite is like a tick or a mite and those things will feed off the elephant's blood and it's not very comfortable it makes you itch a lot it's like a mosquito almost and so they then have to try and rub those off and get rid of them So Tala, you're asking how elephants sleep. Well, a big female elephant like that, she won't sleep for too long at all. She'll only probably sleep for about 20 minutes every day. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit just so we can get this tree out of our way. So, I mean, not 20 minutes only for the day. She'll sleep 20 minutes at a time, maybe three, four times in a day. They don't sleep very much at all. Whereas the baby elephants, they sleep a little bit more. And when they sleep, how they'll sleep is they'll just go and find some sort of a shady area and then they go and lie down. Now Seb, I'm battling a little bit to find you a gap. There we go, there we go. You can use the tree to frame it nicely. Um, and they'll lie down next to their mom and then they fall asleep like that for a little bit. They sleep, sleep a lot longer than the moms because they're still small and they get tired because they walk a lot. Whereas the adults, they get used to walking and so they don't mind walking too much. Now let's just try go back again because our tree is in our way again. Hold on, let's just see if we can't get into this little section here. Seb, this might be a little bit better. So we're trying to see if we can't find a better gap for you guys while they throw the dust around. Now, hopefully that will be okay there. You can see, look at all the dust being sprayed. Isn't that very cool? I always love watching Ellie's dust bath because they look like they're having so much fun. It seems like they really like to do this. And then when they take these big trunkfuls and throw them all over themselves, it really does help to make them sort of very clean, actually, even though they look like they're getting dirty. So Zyma, elephants will eat lots of vegetation. So vegetation is like grass and leaves and roots and bark. That's what they like. So they don't eat any meat or any protein like that. They get all the nutrients they need from the grass and leaves. And you can actually see that this baby elephant was trying to find something to eat there. It was trying to use its trunk and its foot to break a tree to be able to eat it. Now that we're going into our winter months, because we are in the southern hemisphere, our summer is now over so we're starting to head into winter and that means that the grass is going to start dying because we don't get any rain in our winter and so they will now change towards the trees and they're going to eat more trees and bark and roots than they would in the summer months but look they're going to just go behind us now okay girl okay so she's shaking her head because she wants to protect her babies. She's making sure that we are not coming too close to her babies. And she'll stand like that and she'll wait for her babies to go past her. Once she knows the babies are safe, then look, she see, she carries on again. So she's told us, that's close enough. I don't want you any closer. And then we have to respect that because elephants are very, very strong. And they can do a lot of damage to us if we go too close. Now I'm going to just turn around quickly, said before they cross the road. So Netra and Elliot, you're wondering why the elephant has a tusk. Well, the tusks are also very, very useful for being able to break off roots and bark from the trees to be able to feed off them. Also, it provides protection. So if they're getting attacked by something, they can use their tusks to defend themselves. Now, this big mommy elephant here, you'll see that she doesn't have a tusk on her right-hand side. So she broke her tusks off, which means that she's not going to get a new one, unfortunately. It's like if you break your tooth and you don't go to the dentist they're not going to be able to fix it right so let's see now if we can just stop here hopefully the elephants will come out again for us they are going to go into a very deep thicket and it's going to be very tough to follow them in there so this is probably the last view we're going to get before they disappear into the trees there we go 
but those tusks are like another hand for them it's a very good thing that they can use and like I say you'll see sometimes they'll dig the, tr the tusk into the tree and then they use their trunk to break the branch over the tusk and be able to get the food that they need so they need those all the time and, and also helps with defending themselves now she's having a rub against the tree so you can just hear her rubbing up and she's what I was saying earlier is when they get that sand on them then they go to a tree and they rub and it helps just to get rid of all of those sort of parasites and any loose skin cells that they have and keeps their body nice and clean but watch how amazing it is when they walk into the trees like this how quickly they disappear for such a big animal So Zarya, you wondering how elephants wiggle their ears? Well, they have muscles that are attached to ligaments and to the ear itself. And as they need to flap their ear, then they will just contract that muscle and that will bring the ears coming forward. So when I say contract, it's basically like when they squeeze. So if you had to squeeze your fist, you are contracting your muscle and squeezing your fist very tightly. And it's the same thing. The muscles here will contract like this and the ear will come forward and then relax and go back again. So it's like opening and closing your fist that's how the ear wiggles around and moves around so it's very very important that they have those muscles working properly because otherwise the ear doesn't work and that means that they're not going to be able to hear very well or be able to cool themselves down but look at how they just disappear I was saying to you earlier that you would think a big ele elephant like that would be easy to see all the time but you can see there as they go into the bush it's very difficult to carry on seeing them they, that grey body really blends in very very well well, that was a nice surprise to see the elephants. It was very, very good. So we're going to try and see if we can't go and find that lioness that I was talking about earlier. And while we do that, let's go back to Taylor and see what she's busy with. I was looking for spiders and then I was also looking for elephants. But I haven't found either of the two. But we have found this beautiful bird feeding in the grass. Now look at its amazing colours. And it is lovely in the golden light at the moment. And this is called a birchal starling. And we get many different starlings here. And what you can see is, Craig, can you see that impala that's just popped out just above the starling? There's actually another species of starling. Maybe it's a birchal, so it's a bit difficult to see from here. But it's hopping around the ground near that impala. And just as the birds like to feed together to flush out the insects, this impala is doing exactly the same thing for the bird. So the impala, the antelope, walks around and then as the insects are disturbed in the grass, the little birds catch them. Now there's lots of different birds that do this. The starlings are very common. The wattled starlings, the birchall starlings, the cape glossy starlings do it. Woo! And off the impala goes, not hanging around, must be late for a meeting or something. And then, but there are many, many different others that do it too. But I think that that's quite cool. Sometimes you see the buffalo weavers also following around groups of animals. Well, that's quite nice. And I'm glad that you got to see the elephants with Tristan. Because my luck at the watering holes today doesn't seem to be very lucky at all. But what we are going to be doing when I eventually turn Wendy the truck around, <laughs> do a 158 point turn. Whoops! We are going to go to Cheetah Plains. I have to ask Megan. Did Tristan show all the lovely children elephant dung? Or didn't he show them elephant dung? Ooh! Okay, look at this. Tristan didn't show you, so I'm going to show you. That's great. Aha! Look at this massive thing. Can you believe that this is only one ball of elephant dung? Now, I'm going to plug my earpiece in while I stand here and show you this so I can hear if any of you ask questions. Now, elephants have to eat lots and lots of food every single day it's important that they do and the reason why they have to eat a lot more than most animals is because their digestive system their tummy doesn't digest their food very well so you can see it quite clearly here if you just have a look at it you can see pieces of grass you can see pieces of leaves maybe even a little bit of fruit here and there they only digest about 40 percent of their food isn't that crazy so i love this stuff and all of you who are watching that do watch the show and have watched it for a very long time know that this is my favorite stuff in the whole world. Woo, let's get some of this, some sand out here. And um, I'll tell you a bit more about this now, but Elijah's got a question. And I know we don't have too much time left of the school. And Elijah, your question was, do elephants ever get sick? Of course they do. But 
the animals out here in the bush are resilient to a lot of things because they're exposed to lots of bacteria, lots of diseases. They've got a better tolerance of surviving things, a better immunity, if you will. Sort of like how every year you almost pick up the common cold and flu. Elephants might not pick up something like that, but they can definitely pick up things like anthrax. They can get... What else can they get? They can get all sorts of bone diseases. They can get stomach ailments, so they can get an upset stomach too if they eat something that's not so good. But it is quite difficult for them to get quite sick. So this is a healthy elephant though. The fact that it is a big ball of dung like this, it's round, it's solid. If it was, if it was loose and it wasn't firm like this, then you could tell that the, there was something wrong with the elephant's tummy. Now I wish I had a lighter here, but I don't have one here. And my name is not Stefan de Boer, so I can't just spark a, uh, a spark to light this elephant dung but it makes for a really good insect repellent now out here you can ask anybody that lives in the bush there are so many flies especially on hot days like this and also lots of mosquitoes out here and mosquitoes are nasty creatures because they can carry malaria and we don't want to get bitten by malaria especially well the Anopheles mosquito carries the malaria so what I like to do is I like to burn this put it in a little tin and burn it and let it smolder and it keeps all the insects away isn't that incredible that something that has come out the opposite end of an elephant after it's eaten the vegetation you can pick it up and you can use it to help keep away some other irritating insects like the flies of course and the mosquitoes now I'm not worried that I picked up this dung and I'm sure probably a few of you are going you why have you got that in your hands that's so disgusting but herbivore dung so animals that just eat vegetation it's okay to pick up their dung I'll even put impala dung in my mouth and I wouldn't be too worried Craig just pulled the biggest face he did this did that to me basically you wouldn't put I've made Craig put impala dung in his mouth <laughs> so I'm not too worried but I probably will wash my hands but what you must never do is you must never pick up dung from a carnivore so from wild dogs from a lion from a leopard from a hyena because their stomach has got horrible bacteria in them in order to digest all the different types of meat and you know sometimes when they do find something that they need to eat it's been sitting in the Sun for a couple of days maybe even a week so it doesn't smell very nice and I can promise you it doesn't taste very nice nice either so you want to leave that alone and it's also good not to touch bones while you're in the bush because you don't know if they have any diseases anthrax is very real out here and the spores can last in the ground for many 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 years so you don't want to touch bones either be very very careful about that but elephant dung giraffe dung impala dung kudu dung that's all good you can pick that up and you can also use it as a soccer ball look at that it's great all sorts of games in the bush. <laughs> That's how we keep our, ourselves entertained out here. Let me climb back in now. Right, go back around. Plug myself back in. I'm now also covered in elephant dung. Did I cover you, Craig, in elephant dung? <laughs> right. Let's go. It doesn't seem to be too active. Now, Andre, you're wondering what do elephants do in the winter? Andre, pretty much the they're pretty much the same things that they do in the summer, except I think they have to move around a little bit more because their food is yellow at the moment. So it's not that delicious anymore. So elephants, all the animals want to eat the green, green leaves, the green grass, the freshest fruit. They don't want to have to eat this old stuff that's drying out now. So, well, when winter comes along, we don't really get any rain and that becomes a problem so that means that these animals have to move around they've got to find new water they've got to go and find new grass they've got to go and find all of these wonderful things that means they have to travel far distances and I think elephants are pretty lucky when it comes to their size and they've got very good stamina and they're able to travel many many miles every single day to go and look for new food did you see that fly that just landed on my face I need to burn some elephant dung and I've also got <laughs> lots of spider webs on me all of a sudden it must have been from my jumping spider friend that I had earlier all right let's go and have a look now there are lots of old elephant tracks over here so I think they may have been moving through here last night maybe even earlier this morning it's a bit difficult to tell but they were at the dam Craig can you see those mud patches just on the ground just over there look at that so that that you can see over there that is actually dropped off from an elephant you can't see the tracks but there's a couple of old tracks so it would have wallowed in the little pan that we were just at where the kudu and the impala and the birchall starlings were 
and because it maybe didn't have a tree to rub up against there was a lot of that mud still dripping off of its body so it walked across the road I don't know which way it came maybe it came from the dam went that way and then I don't know where it would have gone from here but it dropped a couple of bits of mud but that doesn't look very fresh there's a lot more of it coming over here so that could have been from like I said probably yesterday I think um, I think it's been nice and nice and nice and hot here. But unfortunately, that's all the time we've got for the two schools that have joined us today. So thank you so much. And I hope that you learned a little bit and we put some smiles on your faces. And we look forward to having chats with you guys again soon. So from all of us here, we'll see you next time. But I'm going to send you back across now to Tristan. <laughs> Well, that was quite a good school drive. We had lots of entertainment and Taylor playing soccer and talking about all the little things was a lot of fun. But we're now back into our normal drive again and we're with some beautiful Nyala. So it's just a female and her young ones and they're kind of just drifting along through this beautiful grass. It's that nice time of the day when the light is starting to soften. It was very bright when we started but in the last sort of 20 minutes I would say the light has gotten much much softer and it almost feels like that afternoon gold is starting to filter in and these sort of young Nyala that have that bright rusty vibrance to them especially when this afternoon light hits them so really nice to see them and the other side of it is that our Nyalas often don't spend too much time out in the open to actually see them standing around and kind of letting us get a really good visual of them is quite unique. What have you heard? Look how she peeks her ears up. So as she walks she's always very cautious, particularly because she's got a baby with her. She's going to even be more cautious than normal. And there's one thing about Anyala that I really like is their tail. They've got this big bushy flat kind of tail that they curl up and then every now and then you'll see it kind of wags along and the tip looks as though it's almost disjointed from the actual rest of the tail it seems to wag a lot more than the rest of the tail you can see that there we go it's always quite funny to watch it's kind of this big thick tail at the base and then this tiny little thing that wags at the end when they're trying to keep the flies away and you can see she's twitching a little bit I'm sure near that mud there'll be a few flies hanging around there as they try and sequester the moisture from the actual mud itself what have you heard, girl? So they're very alert animals. The wind is also just all of a sudden kicked up a little bit. And so maybe on the wind she's picked up a scent of something or heard a rustling in the grass because the wind is blowing now. And that's why she's just having a little look and checking. But you can see how well their camouflage works. As she goes behind that tree it's almost impossible to actually see her. There we go. And George, you say they almost look like they have a foxtail. Well, yes, it does look like that, doesn't it? Just the end bit that looks a little bit different, but otherwise it is. It's bushy and it's kind of that reddish coloration with the white tip. It does look very fox-like indeed. Although it seems to kind of curl right up. And I wonder why their tail is so much bushier than everybody else's. You know, if you look at kudu and bushbuck, they don't have tails like that. It's just really the nyala that do. But they are probably the most exotic looking of our antelope. So, Eclair, you're wondering if the Nyala's stripe patterns between each individual is unique. Well, yes, it is. So, every single Nyala will have a different stripe pattern and different way the stripe runs and different numbers of stripes on the actual body themselves. So, it's like a fingerprint. And the babies will actually use that when they're young to be able to find their mothers. So, when they are born, the mother will separate slightly from a group of Nyala and she'll keep her young one close to her. And that pattern will imprint on that baby's brain. And then when the baby gets it's all and they go back into a herd situation it knows exactly who its mom is by being able to see the contrast of the patterns as well as there will be a scent of, of smell as well so um, those will be the two ways that they're able to find one another I wonder if we're going to find anything at Biffleswick Dam. Unfortunately, we haven't had much luck with our lioness, so we were talking about it in pre-show. 
I did find her trucks again, but they go into such a thick area and there's no real road that runs close enough to that drainage area to actually see what's going on. So what I think I might do is we might ask Herbie while we sort of doing these two feeds with the vehicles to see if he can't get onto those tracks and maybe we just maybe we can find the den site or wherever this lioness keeps going to for whatever reason maybe we can find out what it is so we're going to try and see if we can get onto that i'm also going to go back into that area later this afternoon when it gets a little bit dark so in the last sort of half an hour of drive i'm going to try a head in there and see if we can't just um, do some loops around and maybe we get lucky and we find that lioness coming out of there she definitely from what I can see didn't cross north like the other lioness tracks that we had going into Torchwood and Biffles Hook Her tracks look as though they stay inside our property It's difficult because of the number of vehicles that drive up and down this boundary to actually make sure And this morning by the time I got here there was a number of vehicles already come past me In fact, I saw two vehicles past me So it's possible that the tracks were driven over but I hold out hope and hopefully it will be one of our Inkahuma lionesses that will be there now for those of you who don't know who Ambies is or Inkahuma females, the Inkahuma pride is our sort of more resident pride. They've been a bit in absence the last few months, which is quite typical for them in summer. What happens in this particular area is the grazing to the north of where we are in the Manuleti and into Kruger has, is much better in the summer than it is here. And so our buffalo herds all end up going up there for the summer months and it means that we have very few buffalo down here, which means the Inkahuma pride has very little to eat. And so they tend to shift into Manuleti, sometimes into Simamili and they move around a little bit more. In the winter they tend to start coming back to this area as the buffalo start moving back because of the water that we have in this area. Lots of pans that are man-made which cause uh, water to be held even through the dry times and that means the buffalo then come to try and find that water. And then when the buffalo are here obviously the lions come in as well. So they hopefully, well the hope is, is that the Inkuma Pride is going to start coming back now as we start pushing into the winter months. We're just getting to Buffleshook Dam now. We've got some beautiful... Just gonna try and sh get down here a little bit because try and get a little bit of a lower view on these hippos. It'd be, be quite nice. And we can't get too low because as you can see, it drops off into the dam itself, but we can at least get slightly low that we can actually see all of them. Now, I know James was here this morning and I think he said he had four hippos, which is good. It means that we got a stable hippo population. Every time I've kind of come to this dam, there's been at least two or three hippos here, and that's always encouraging. It means that hopefully through the winter months, our hippos will stay and these will become a sort of permanent feature of this area because this dam, remember, dried up in last year's winter and all the hippos left and so it's going to take a bit of time for them to start coming back again but you can see the rippling as another one is going to breach the surface shortly i wonder if it's going to come up next to those two i don't think so seb i think it's going to pop off somewhere else but you can see now that we've just approached they've decided to just lower their head slightly but they're still keeping their eyes and their ears above water and the hippo's head design is so well done that it's able to breathe see and hear which is all the senses that they have by just sort of allowing their head to be above water so the rest of the body can be completely concealed but they can just put their heads up and still be able to breathe and see and be aware of their environment and make sure that if any predators are around that they can pick them up because remember with hippos in the water they're not very concerned with any predators in the water even though crocodiles could potentially be in here they know that crocs won't really target them because of their sheer size and power the crocs are a bit wary of them so their real threats come from land-based predators like lions and big clans of hyenas and so that's why they need to be able to see and hear above water more than they do below water but they are still very sleepy Ah, Adele, this is a good question because you want to know how long is a hippo pregnant for and whether or not they co-parent. Well, a hippo is pregnant for eight months, which is very, 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 very short. Much shorter than a lot of the other animals of similar size. So if we take rhino, for example, which is the same size as a hippo roughly, they will gestate for about 14 to 16 months. So slightly longer, or in fact double the time than what the hippo does. Um, and the fact is that the hippo has a shorter gestation than even people now. 
Now, the reason for that is because they spend their time in an environment, as we've just spoken about, that is quite safe. So they can give birth to their baby, which they do in water, and the croc might be a threat to it, but generally the adult is so close um, that the crocodile is never going to get really that close to the baby. She'll also push that baby right into the shallows that makes it difficult for the crocodile to get past her to the baby. So it means there's very few threats for a baby hippo, and that that's why it can come out much earlier, a little bit less developed as something like a rhino. A rhino has to face so many threats on land from leopard, lions, wild dogs, hyena, that it needs to come out a lot bigger, a lot stronger, a lot thicker skin to be able to survive. And, and so that's why the gestation period is so different. In terms of co-parenting, um, not really. I suppose the male does provide protection for the, the female and the group and the babies by keeping the water hole to himself. So another male that would potentially come in here, he's going to try and chase that male off and make sure that this is their area only. Whereas, you know, they, but from there they won't do any other sort of play any other part in parenting of that of that young one. The females do the rest of it. But you can see the difference between the male and the females. Look at the male on the left. Look at the size of his head and the distance between his nostrils and his um, ears. Now his nostrils have gone underwater unfortunately but he'll pop his head up again just now. And if you compare that to the two on the right you'll see that he has got almost double the size in terms of a head than the two on the right hand side is. So he's much much larger than what they are. But the females have a tough job. It's not easy to keep one of these little baby hippos alive. Got to kind of suckle them in the water as well as provide food for them. Ah, so Ali, you want to know how far these hippos can travel if the water runs out in this particular dam? Well, Ali, they can travel a very long way. Generally, what they'll do is they'll try and travel at night unless it is an extreme dire situation. So last year in the drought, we did see them traveling during the day, but generally they try and do most of their traveling at night when it's cooler. There's no sun that they can dehydrate their body and they'll then move around. And it's not uncommon for a hippo to do 20 kilometers in a night. They can just wander their way around feeding as they go and it will depend on their sort of dominance as to how far they do one day at night but in terms of looking for water sources they will just keep traveling until they do so they can cross big distances there was a lot of the hippos from the Sabi sands actually started to move and they left the sand and Sabi river and all of these water holes as they dried and they pushed towards the bigger river section so they would have gone up and towards the olifants and the taba rivers where there was still water available and that distance is over 100 120 kilometers from where we are now um, up to those rivers and so they would have moved quite a bit. Now you can see Seb has spotted some thick knees and a terrapin on the other side there and some elephant dung. So we've got the thick knees on the left and those are spotted thick knees because they do not actually have the white wing bar that the water thick knee will have. Now hopefully I've gotten that right because sometimes I get a bit confused with this. I'm just going to make 100% sure. Then you can see there's our terrapin, varying descriptions of terrapins and sizes. There's babies, there's big ones. I just heard all the Franklin's alarm calling. I wonder if they didn't f spot something. Just listening to see if they keep uh, actually talking. But as I was saying now with the spotter thickney versus the water thickney, which is the birds that we're talking about. So if we have a look at this particular bird that you see there, you notice that its wings have got spots but no big prominent white band that I can see. There's a bit of glare on my monitor, so I'm gonna use my binoculars rather, because it actually might be a water thickening. I think I can see a bit of white. Is there a bit of white there, Seb? I can't see nicely, there's lots of glare. Ah, there is white there, so. That is actually the water thickney, so sorry about that everyone. The water thickney does have that little white window and pale wing bar that the spotted thickney doesn't have. Now you do get both species here so it's not uncommon to see both of them but that is the water thickney indeed. Now I'll show you what the spotted thickney looks like if you have a look here Seb. Oh sorry. That's no, okay. So Seb <laughs> went towards the hippos but I'll show you now. So this is the spotted thickney here. So we can see it lacks that white on the window bar itself so it's got just that spotted sort of wing area over there whereas the water thickney which we were looking at now you see it's got that black line and that little white stripe that we were seeing on the bird that we saw across the water now just now and then if I go back there we go you can see the spotted doesn't have that white 
All right, so that's why we know it's the water thickening. Right, well that's solved that mystery, Seb. Sorry about that. I sold Seb a bit of a dummy there, as we say in rugby terms, which means you kind of gave a fake pass. <laughs> mm. Now, I'm going to sit here and probably just enjoy the sights and sounds of Buffelzuk Dam a little bit longer because it is very pretty at this time of the afternoon. And while I do that, I believe Miss McCurdy has traveled to the far east and is bathing in the glorious sunshine that is shining down on Cheetah Plains. I am indeed. <laughs> that was a fantastic link, wasn't it, hey Craig? It was beautiful. It was like beautiful sounds to my ears. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, of course, is did you all enjoy Tristan's box that he wore during the pre-show? Megan, he did wear the box, didn't he? That Jerry spent copious amounts of sort of blood, sweat and tears in creating. I don't know what it was, but it was very interesting watching them all colour in at uh, lunchtime today. Uh, the things that of course the team gets up to but I know we just had the school drive and I didn't get to chat too much of you but in case you were wondering I had a fantastic holiday it was lots of fun and I brought presents back which I'll be revealing over the next couple of days and I'm actually going to stop just up here at the main part of three in a row pan and I'm going to show you the first presents I bought with there's no elephants here which is very disappointing because the first thing that I wanted to see coming back to work is of course my favorite animal in the entire world. Should we stop? Yes, let's stop here because the light is so pretty. Now I'm, going, I'm not showing you yet, I'm hiding it from you. I'm going to sneak it out the car and I'm actually going to stand out the car. Quiz time! I've come back with lots of new ideas of what we can do to entertain you when the animals are being naughty and not showing themselves. First quiz of the day. What is this? Who does this feather belong to? Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter with your answers and I look forward to your response. But just to give you an idea of how big it is, let's do, let's do the size, yeah. It's pretty long, right? It's quite big, okay? So it's on the side of my arm. It's a big feather. I don't know. I don't know if anyone's going to guess this, but we'll give it a go, right? And then we'll, we'll chat a little bit more about that feather once you get some answers. No terrapins? Well, no, no terrapins now that I got out the car and scared them all away. Let's try the next pan. Right, uh, I'm so glad to be back here. It's been so beautiful. And it seems as though Mr. and Mrs. Blacksmith Lapwing have now multiplied. There's not just one Mr. and Mrs. Blacksmith Lapwing, there are now four of them just on the edge of the pan, down that end. Ooh, a little roll back there. There's one. There's two, there's three. Oh no, there is the fourth one there. Look at that. So they're just moving around at the moment. Now that's quite interesting because, as most of you know, the blacksmith lapwings are quite territorial and you often see them having little arguments with the three banded plovers. The, the two of those two species don't seem to enjoy each other too much. And I suppose it's because they're competing for the same food sources around here. Little insects in the grass and on the mud and the surface of the water is what they normally be pecking at. But I can't believe that they're tolerating another pair. Now we come past here quite often and we normally see just Mr. and Mrs. Blacksmith Lapwing. I wonder if it's not their chicks that are maybe grown up. Could it be possible that they would have sprouted into beautiful adults already? It's a bit difficult to say, isn't it? But they're not really making much noise at all. They're very, very comfortable with each other. A couple of little kick, 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 kicks every now and then. But other than that, just grooming themselves. And no terrapins. No terrapins today. Just one or two little heads bobbing about. But let's continue. Let's see if we're going to find my favorite animal. They were definitely here, the elephants, at some point in the last few days. There's plenty of activity. And um, obviously because I've been away now, I've missed out on who's been seen, what's been seen, all these types of things. And just back at the junction where Three in a Row Pan starts up with the most eastern boundary, we saw some female leopard tracks. Difficult to tell how old they were because they were just off the side of the road and, and, and as you know we mainly drive in, in sort of one track so this is sort of off to the edge and it's often where we see lots of leopard tracks and I haven't seen any more on these roads so I suspect that they could be a couple of days old and I know Nkanyeni likes to come in from that side too. Alright but now remember 
I'm still waiting for answers for the feather so hashtag Safari Live with who you think this is from and then I'll give you some time to think in the meantime we're gonna go across all the way to the Mara now where Brent has got some animals with loads of stripes but we're on a plane a little bit bigger in Kenya welcome to the sunset safari there we have some zebras on the short grass plains welcome to majestic the majestic Maasai Mara my name is Brent Deer Smith I have dangerous Dave Eastall on camera and we're just in loving this lovely late afternoon light it's a almost perfect temperature the zebras look quite content on this lovely short grass here we're right down next to the Mara River uh, right in the sort of north eastern corner of the Mara Triangle and we've been looking for leopards and that's one of the reasons we've been sitting in this spot for a while. And a little while ago there was some nervous impala around and uh, one female was snorting but I think she was just paranoid because we've sat, we've listened, we've looked, we've scanned, we've scoured and we've searched but alas no leopard just yet. But of course the wonderful thing about the Mara is there's just so much game around uh, even in that what is called the quiet season. Oh, what is that, Dave? To the right. To the right, to the Dave. <laughs> there we go. We've got some topi. And uh, next to a rather scraggly gardenia. Uh, that's just off to the left. There we go. Now, those little gardenia trees are actually very, very important to us as we mission around the Mara because they are often in the tiniest little bit of shade and a very sad looking gardenia like that, you can find a pile of lions. Of course, with the topi being so close to that particular little gardenia, I doubt we're going to find our pile of lions there. Now, there are quite a few other animals out on the plain and we're going to see if we can find them. So, I did see some coax hartebeest a bit earlier and I know some people haven't seen them yet so we'll be heading towards that area. I still want to do one more little scratch around on the edge of the river hoping for a spotted predator and then we'll start moving our way further to the south towards the Samaki Swamp. The elephants are always great in this afternoon and of course that is part of the core area of the Angama Pride but it is absolutely gorgeous this evening. What do you think Dave? Beautiful. Beautiful, Dave. Absolutely beautiful. And if you want to tell us how beautiful it is, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We would love to hear from you. And uh, of course, isn't this very, very exciting to be able to go on safari in Kenya and South Africa uh, in the same sort of couple of hours? I definitely think that's a world first. Oh, Dave. Butterfly! Oh no, it's coming too close to the car. Where's it gone? Oh, he is. is he landed? Is he he has. Oh, now there's a butterfly that you should all know. So there's our first Mara quiz, or well, second Mara quiz actually. But that is a butterfly that also occurs at Tijuma. Although I don't know if I can actually quiz you on something moving that quickly, I probably can't. Uh, so while I, I think of another quiz, David was wondering, uh, do the leopards here adapt to less thickets and and less trees? Uh, well, they do and they don't. Now I'm, I'm I'm moving along the river. There's lots of big trees and these croton thickets. And if you are looking for leopards, this is the spot to do it along the river or along the drainage lines as you would um, in any part of Africa but of course uh, can be a little bit more difficult for them there's a lot more competition out as soon as they move away from these thickets and that but there we go there's those nervous impala I'm looking not so nervous at the moment so uh, I would say that they're behavior will be slightly different than due to the amount of predator competition but as soon as you find uh, wooded areas and thickets there's always a good chance you might come across a leopard now, as I say, that leopard leap out of the bush onto that impala. <gasps> now! Or don't. Well, dear. So, we're going to keep moving along at the edge of the Mara River, seeing what else we can find. And as we say, it's absolutely wonderful to have you on this live safari with us. And we can't wait to find out what wonders are around the next bend in the Mara River. Okay. So, here we go. Oh, he's quite an old boy. Now, the interesting thing about these impalas, their horns are completely massive uh, in comparison to the southern African variety. 
And uh, that's because they don't have a set breeding season. So basically, he's like a gym bunny on steroids. And his testosterone just keeps producing because he's got to keep competing for mating rights throughout the year. And you can find baby impalas at all times of the year here. Isn't that wonderful? Bubba's all year round. You can see why a leopard would like this a crotong thicket because it's a nice spot to sneak up on any unsuspecting poor creature. Oh, I hear a hippo in the distance. Mm, oh, 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 oh. But Tristan seems to have one in sight. Well, Brent, you sound like Santa Claus because I can hear you in my ear through the final control and you're sort of ho-ho-hoing like a Santa Claus, which is quite funny. And it's quite strange to hear Brent's voice. It's been a while since I've heard it, but I'm glad he's having a wonderful time out there and that he's seeing so many amazing things. It's really very, very cool and so good that we can show you all of it as well. It's such an exciting project that we've undertaken and going into the Mara is really going to be such a special experience and there's going to be so many incredible moments coming out of the Masai Mara as they have been on Juma over the years. So it's going to be really cool to combine the two and see the two of them working hand in hand. It's going to make for some excellent viewing over the next few months. Wouldn't you agree, Seb? Mm. Yes, exactly. Well, our hippos are still taking it very easy. They are certainly very happy with the serene, quiet, waterhole. No ellies have come down to disrupt anything. The terrapins have been behaving themselves and haven't been climbing on their heads or their backs and so it's all been very very sedate and very very peaceful. There's still this little sneaky cold wind that is blowing but it, every now and then it drops and then it is absolutely beautiful. That light is fantastic on the hippos. You can see it's just all the banks are bla sort of golden with color as that sun's hitting them. The hippos are slowly but surely kind of starting to move around a little bit but they're really not interested in doing too much just yet. So, Fraley, you're wondering if the hippo skin is as thick as elephant skin. Well, actually, it can be thicker in places. Hippo skin is very, very thick, and the reason why it needs to be thick is because of the fighting that they do. So, they'll have, you know, these massive territorial battles with the males, and these big canines that come, or sorry, not canines, in sizes, should I say, they come out and they're able to cut through skin. So, if they had a thin skin, they would end up having a lot of problems. That thick skin helps for them to be able to s sort of withstand a lot of those fights and they're able to then basically protect themselves so their skin can be over two inches thick in places so it is very 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 thick and it's got a massive fat layer in it as well that insulates them and allows them to be able to stay warm in cold weather like we're having now and the water will definitely be very very cold in the next few days and we end up with a situation where we're going to find that it must sort of the temperature will drop and so those hippos will need that blubber to stay warm and then you'll find that even during the day they're going to start coming and lying on the banks just to try and help warm up as well so so they do have very, very thick skin and in places thicker than what the elephant has. It's always quite interesting. I've seen quite a few hippo carcasses in my time, hippos that have died from other hippos, and you go try and see if you can even cut that skin, it's impossible. I've seen many rangers trying, um, particularly the reason why is because hippos, if they're not found by scavengers straight away, they tend to expand at a rate of knots. As this breakdown of the meat starts to happen, you end up with this gaseous expansion within the abdomen area as the sort of all the plant material that is decomposing ends up building up and uh, you'll find the situation where you try and open a hippo up as soon as you find it so that the gases get out as well as the fact that the scavengers can then get in because hippo skin is so tough in places that a lot of the time vultures actually can't even get through it they need to wait for hyenas to arrive for it to happen and so I've seen rangers when there's been a hippo die that, that cuts them and the amount of effort you've got to go through to cut a hippo skin is quite something so it really is very very strong and very very thick Right, so we've been talking about cutting and rangers cutting, and our very own Miss McCurdy apparently is busy hacking away at a tree. Ha! I'm live! 
I'm obviously I'm standing on the top of the car at the moment yielding a panga and well this is one of the things I suppose that we have to do when you're out on safari is we carry pangas with us to cut overhanging branches <laughs> that's what you've caught me doing and I've been chopping I'd love to say that I've just started but I've been hacking away at this for quite some time because bush willow is not necessarily the softest wood but now there's quite a few here you can go we'll, we'll deal with that one just now this is the real pain actually both of them maybe if I cut it here no that's not gonna work see I wanted to cut this part over here but I think with my little panga I'd probably be here for the next two days so we will do this one this thin one very quickly and very careful you've got to be very careful of course it's very sharp you got to hold it nice and tight but the other thing that I've also realized is I should probably put my sunglasses on and do this because I keep getting little ch chips of wood hitting me in the face yeah and this is also a great way to get your frustrations out and I think Craig is a little bit envious of me hey Craig I bet you you probably be a lot better at this as well seeing as though you're much stronger than me <sighs> Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> One little chop here. Woo down goes it. We're on the last one. And I've been meaning to do this for like the last eight months. <laughs> I keep saying that I must cut this and I haven't. I'm the queen of procrastination. So now we're gonna do it now. Almost done. <sighs> No, not ready just yet, almost. And then we will get to our feather answers. Ooh, almost. <laughs> it's a lot harder than it looks, I can promise you that. There we go. Right, now, now we need to get down. Ah, that was easier than trying to climb over all of the leaves. And let's not do what the elephants do and dr drag the bushes into the, br the road. So we'll chuck them over here. Now we can go under, Craig, almost. There's one... <laughs> There's one more that needs to be done, but we will save that for another day. Okay. We'll do a cleaning segment next. <laughs> Let me just get some of these leaves out. And then we'll carry on with the safari. I'm filthy. Now I feel like I'm at home, seeing as I'm covered in leaves and in dirt. What a workout, Craig! Woo! <laughs> um, now, while I catch my breath, that was exhausting. I have to get back into my fitness routine. That's one thing we never, none of us ever do on holidays, actually go for runs. Uh, sorry, Megan, what, what does everybody want to know? I've forgotten. I heard you, but then I didn't hear you. Oh. <laughs> now, a lot of you are wondering why I've been so desperate to cut the branch. And it's because we've got a massive aerial that sticks out of the back of the cars. And so what happens is that as we're driving along, we've got to be very careful about what branches we go to. Because if we hit the trees too hard with those aerials, we're obviously going to break them and then we won't be able to see you because that's where the signal is going well coming from the car and then shooting out to wherever it needs to go I'll spare the technical details and um, we have to otherwise bend it backwards so we go past this road quite often and like I said I keep saying we need to do it we need to chop those trees and I never do it so I thought we'd do it now ah now I've got to find my feather again Craig, did I, what did I do with it? Hmm, I've, well, did I lose my feather? That's so sad, I think I've lost my feather. Have you got it? Under my seat. Now, oh, Megan, can I please have those things again? Sorry, I was just very worried that I'd lost my feather. <laughs> ah, okay. So Stephanie, you've guessed Eagle Owl, and then there was one more guess. Janet, Marshall Eagle. So those are the two guesses that we've had so far. Now I must tell you that unfortunately you are incorrect. Kim, you've said a vulture. It's a good guess because we're getting 
more to the size of the bird now, but Kim, unfortunately, vulture is also incorrect. It's a difficult one. It's one we don't get to see. Ooh, Stefan, here we've got some interesting questions coming through. Stefan, you've said perhaps a European honey buzzard. Now, that's something I haven't seen in a very long time. I used to see it was one that lived on Kareka Game Reserve down in the Eastern Cape, so I got to see that every day. A little bit too big. It is from a primary feather, so it's, it's from the wing, so it, you can see it's a massive feather. Let me see if anybody's got it right. I actually don't know if Megan even knows what this is, because I, I didn't really tell anybody. I told Craig. Ooh. Now, Faisal, you've said a juvenile harrier hawk. That's again a very good guess because of the mottling that you've got on these feathers. So anything juvenile would be a great guess. Normally mottled in brown and white, but unfortunately, those are all incorrect. So I'm going to just tell you the right answer. This is from a Cory Bustard. Can you believe that? I haven't seen a Cory but well, I hadn't seen a Cory Bustard. It avoided me for years and years and years. Searched in the Kruger, could not find one. Finally, I saw 10 in the Mapungupwe National Park. They are the most incredible birds I've ever seen, and a picture of them really doesn't do them justice, but I shall show you one. But it is the heaviest bird that we have, flying bird, in, uh, in southern Africa, which I think is pretty cool. Don't you? Amazing. And they're pretty heavy. I think males can get to about 12 and a half kilograms or so, a huge wingspan of just over two and a half meters. So a big bird. When they come in, I haven't seen this happen, but I have seen video footage. It sounds like a Boeing is about to land. So if you've ever heard an Egyptian geese as it sort of comes down to land into the water, that noise that you get, times that by 10. And that's what a Cory busted sound. So there we go. It was a trick one. Like I said, I told you I brought presents, adding to my feather collection. But we're going to keep carrying on and we'll play some more games on the sun sunrise safari. We'll bring something else out and we'll have a little guess at that. But Tristan has actually she found himself an animal and a rather large bovid. We have indeed. We've probably found the only buffalo bull to be roaming the Juma area at the moment. This is our old friend. He's got mud packed on his back. It's not the same buffalo I saw at Trias Dam the other day, but it is one of them that we see up in this north, sort of eastern corner of the property. He's got quite smooth horns, and then, like I say, he's got sort of an old look about him he's definitely a boy that's done a few laps around you can see he's got some tatty ears and that boss is starting to get a little bit shiny on top which is often a sign of age hello buddy you can also see the dewlap is hanging down from the throat area so that's a sign of that sort of age coming along and the mud that's caked all over him is much the same as what we saw with the elephants earlier at the water hole on the school drive is that it's all there just to one help protect and sort of provide a layer between the sun and him and two is to try and get rid of those parasites so it's encasing any of the ticks and sort of things that walk around on buffalo and making sure that it sort of keeps his skin in good condition now what have you heard you've heard something it was quite amazing. We were driving along and we just saw this explosion of oxpeckers and the oxpeckers were doing this fight in the air and I was saying to Seb that I'm pretty sure there must be a buffalo somewhere close by and luckily enough we came down here, I didn't see it and Seb was eagle-eyed on the back spotted our buffalo and so it's good to see buffalo coming back. If there's buffalo around, it's always a good sign. It means that potentially we will see the lions starting to come back in as well. And like I said, this is not the same buffalo bull that we were seeing around sort of treehouse and that Ingwe Alley and Chelapan. This is a different guy altogether, which is so good that to see another one. But look at the condition that they're in. If you compare this to what we were seeing in October last year, it just is amazing how quickly these animals recover. In October last year, the sort of condition of these buffalo was horrific. There was no muscle structure around the neck. They almost looked like their heads were too big for their bodies. There was no definition. There was no muscles around the hip area, just bones sticking out. And it was really quite a sad sort of situation. And in a few months, and some rain and a bit of green grass, and now look at them. Look at how big and thick that neck is and that body. And there's sort of, there's fat layer now on them. And they are in really healthy condition. And that will not be an easy animal to bring down at all for the lions they're going to have a big struggle on their hands to bring down and subdue a massive buffalo bull like this 
You see how alert he is though, because he's on his own, he doesn't have any friends to help him, so he, every time there's a sort of sound of any bird, and that Franklin that just burst out of the bush and started calling, he gets very alert to it, and you'll see that he's going to sort of put his head up and listen to what's going on. But isn't that beautiful, just in this sort of low-lying area with that golden light filtering through. He's going to get the stare down on the stage. There we go. Sorry about that everybody, the gremlins seem to be back this afternoon but we'll get well working on them of course. Um, I'm back with my karate move, my taekwondo move so we'll sort them out in a matter. I'm actually, I think it was with Tristan, hey? We'll have to have a word with Tristan and teach him how to do some moves. What we're going to do now is we're still searching around Cheetah Plains trying to find life of some sort. So let's go across to Brent in the Mara well, and just have a look at what he's got. Welcome back to Kenya on your very own live safari. We're now with some coax heart beast. Uh, I know some people were wanting to see them. We haven't had a good view of them yet. So a relative of the Terpy, another fast runner, capable of speeds of about up to 80 kilometers an hour. Now, Dave, for the birders, where did they go? Oh no, they have disappeared. Yeah, I'm just going to look carefully into this. Now, on these sort of short grass plains, you get quite a few different species of birds. And we've only seen them once or twice in the Sabi Sands, but I've seen them quite often here. But now, of course, as soon as I want to show them, they've run away. Uh, there were some Temex courses that were on the ground. But we've got some Thompson's gazelles to, to, to look at in the meantime while I try relocate the scurrying little Temex courser. Well, there's about seven of them, and they have absolutely vanished. Hmm. Naughty birdies. We'll have to find them again. Remember, hashtag Safari Live uh, if you want to ask us any questions. So there we go. It's fast becoming one of my favorite antelopes, the Thompson's gazelle. They are very, very cute, and um, they have the most adorable little alarm call. Pee! Pee! There we go. You can see how pregnant a lot of the females are. Um, they should be dropping any moment. I've seen one or two babies, but there should be quite a few baby Tommies around shortly. So unless no luck on the leopards when we've left the Mara River. Oh, and we're now heading out back onto the plane. We're going to head towards an area where we've got a good chance at, at lions and, and elephants and all that and all that around an area called Mitiamazua. I don't even think, well, that's a strange name, and especially if I give you the translation. Mitiamazua means the milk tree. Dave, do you know what a milk tree is? No. Oh dear. Well, it is a euphorbia. So, uh, you will, uh, those of you will who have been to South Africa and whatnot will know them as a, a euphorbia or candelabra tree and um, basically have a very potent multi, milky latex so the road is a particularly big uh, euphorbia so mitia maziwa, miti is tree, maziwa is milk oh they are so cute of course, uh, not the fastest animal, but we've seen them escape cheetah quite a few times now. And it is their ability to make almost 90 degree turns uh, that keeps them, well, out of the predator's bellies more often than not. So they're, they're not by any means a slow poke, but not nearly as fast as a topi or, or, or a coke's heart beast. But they are able to make the most incredibly sharp turns to escape predation. Hunter would like to know, are the Thompson's gazelles like impala? There are so many of them around. Well, we've got lots of impala here as well, um, but they're not like impala. Uh, they are exclusively grazers, so that you will only find them on the grasslands, whereas impala are dual feeders that can browse or graze. But they are probably the most numerous antelope in the, in the Mara. 
And of course, till the Great Migration arrives, then wildebeest are by far the most numerous antelope. But yes, they, they are very numerous. And I, the leopards and, and, and cheetahs prefer them as prey because they are quite a bit smaller than impala. Probably about half the size of an impala, but um, bigger than a steenbok, I would say. But yes, they're very, very pretty. I love their little noses. They're so funny looking. Now, I'm just going to bumble up the road a little bit towards some Defasa waterbuck. Now, of course, that is a slightly different waterbuck species to the one we get in the Sabi Sands. And they lack the circular ring around their bottom, and uh, they have just a plain white bottom that serves the same purpose. So, bear with me. I'll wave. Can you see me waving? Hi! Jack's mom, and um, well, hopefully Jack is watching too, and uh, Jack's mom would like to know, why don't we see Thompson's gazelle in the Sabi sand? Oh, there's a slightly better view of those hartebeest, Dave. I'm still looking out for the courses along the short grass, but no luck just yet. Um, but uh, we don't get Thompson's gazelle in the Sabi sands because... What is going on, Dave? I've got audio coming out of your pocket. Well, that's weird. Sorry. Well <laughs> Dave, what was going on there? So Dave's, Dave's, Dave suddenly had another uh, segment or show going on in his pocket. I heard myself talking. It was quite funny. Okay, well, moving on. There we go. Coke's heart beast in the, and, and the shepherd's tree in the distance. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Uh, there we go. And there's a little Tommy, male Tommy behind. But um, Jack's mom was asking, why don't we get Thompson's gazelle in the Sabi Sands? Well, uh, it's not ideal habitat for them. There's not enough good grass. So they like these short grass plants. Um, being short themselves, they need short grass so they can see their predators. Of course, I'm only joking. But they do prefer short grass to feed on. So uh, the rainfall is probably not high enough. The closest thing to a Thompson's gazelle we get in southern Africa is actually an arid species. Oh, banded mongoose! Dead ahead! See him? Standing up and looking at us. There's a whole whole mob of them coming in. Hi, guys! Sorry, Jack's mom. I got sidetracked. Let me get a bit closer to the banded mongoose. I love them so much. I had them as pets as a child. Um, but so, the, the rainfall's not good enough and... And them basically, and also with that thick, long, uh, long grass and thick bush, uh, they would be eaten very quickly and very sharply by all the smart leopards and lions there. 